Hello, BookTube. As you can see, it's a new environment, <laughs> a new setting. Frida and I have come away to the little farmhouse for the Memorial Day weekend. So it's a new setting, a new camera, a new hair implants. Uh, and some old books <laughs> that I want to show you. Because on the way, I got a few old books. And they mark a sentimental occasion. Uh, because they're the last time that I'm ever going to get books at the Goodwill in Massachusetts. It turns out that the Goodwill stores in Massachusetts have moved from set book pricing to exorbitant, extortionate book pricing of, of what is the same thing. Battered old mass markets and hardcovers that are teeming with STDs. <laughs> so, I was fine with that when the books had a set price. I'm not fine with that if the store is just going to gouge. And I didn't realize it. I didn't even think to look for individual prices on books at a Goodwill until I got to the register. So these will be the last ones I ever get. Uh, but I wanted to show them to you anyway. And they... <laughs> They illustrate a problem. <laughs> it's not really a problem. I actually love it, which is that when I hold up a book on this channel and talk about it, a lot of you feel free to contact me and say, hey, if you don't want that, or hey, if you wouldn't mind sending that, I would love to have it. And that, keep in mind, the way to find out, the way to reach me about this and anything else is my email. That's st.donahue at gmail. And what happens is I then do that, of course, <laughs> unless it's a book that I absolutely treasure. I will immediately put it in an envelope and send it away. So a lot of the things, I think three of the things in this in this little pile here, you have already seen. I've just got them again because I would theoretically like to own my own books. <laughs> and the first is this, The Mirror of Her Dreams by Stephen Donaldson. This is part one of a two-part series called Morden's Dream, uh, which is, uh, you can almost tell from the cover, uh, the, the story starts out with a, a repressed and unhappy young woman in our ordinary world. Uh, who has a fascination with mirrors because she has a very low self-esteem, a poor self-image. But in the in the world beyond her mirrors, there is a fantasy land called Mordent, uh, that where the sorcery is based on mirrors, and mirrors are very rare and very powerful. And th there's a boy <laughs> that she meets in that world. And as I mentioned when I first got this, I the, the last time I showed this on this channel it was an enormous hardcover. Uh, and that I sent away right away. Somebody said, oh, I haven't read that in years. I'll never find it. I don't live anywhere near a used bookstore. Could you send it to me? And that, my answer to that is always yes. So uh, so when I got that hardcover and thought, you know, I'll wait when I get the second copy, the second volume, then I will read the whole thing and see what I think about it. Because I haven't read it since it first came out. Uh, but when I got that first volume, I immediately got rid of it. So now I have this again. I am still waiting <laughs> to find. Now I will wait for a mass market paperback of the second book, which is A Man Rides Through. I seem to remember my initial impressions of this series were largely good. It's intensely overwritten. It could easily have been one book this size. And also there's a weird, there's a weird dynamic running through the book. It's not just that our heroine has a poor self-image. It's there's all sorts of other stuff going on. Middle-aged man fantasizing stuff going on that I I think now in 2019, that would probably not only stick out more to me, but bother me more. Uh, so I, I will see. I'm not going to find out right away because I'm not going to read this and just be left in midair. I want both books. Sooner or later, I will find a mass market of a man rides through and then I'll have both. Uh, and then this next one, we've also seen. I think we saw it in a hardcover and I got rid of it right away because I praised it to the skies. I do every time. It's Star Trek Federation, a Star Trek novel by uh, Judith and Gar Reese Stevens, who are fantastic. They, if, you're, if you go into a used bookstore, and you see a whole shelf of Star Trek novels, and you're wondering, oh my god, there are 30 of these, which are any good? Are any of them any good? And you have the bad taste to be without me, <laughs> if I'm not actually with you, uh, then remember these names. If you get it, if you get a book with these, with these people, with these two, this couple's name on it, it'd more than likely be good. And this is one of the best ones they ever did. Uh, as you can tell from the cover, there's a, a space anomaly that almost makes Captain Picard's Enterprise and James Kirk's Enterprise meet. And this was written before that actually happened, before Kirk and Picard meet in, in Star Trek Generations. But this was written before that, and it's much more carefully done. And the main thrust of the book, as the title indicates, is that it's kind of a historical novel about the life of the Federation. And that is, it's amazingly effectively done. And when I started it, the first time, when it first came out, when was this? Uh, 1980s was this? 1995. When this came out in 1995, when I first started and realized what they were going to do, what they were that they were going to tell the, the, the history of the Federation in Vignettes, 
I suddenly realized what old time Star Trek fans will always realize, which is how much of the past is actually in Star Trek, the original Star Trek. There are all sorts of callbacks to what is for our characters in the 23rd century, the past, but which is to us, the future. I just think that's fascinating. That that was another sign that Gene Roddenberry, however ham-handed he was, was serious about doing science fiction on TV. Uh, and not just having, you know, not, not just forgetting that 300 years had passed between his viewers and this world that he imagined. Like, for instance, we're told about Colonel Green and World War III and Khan Noonien Singh <laughs> and the, the modified human Gary Seven is clearly going to be around for a lot of those adventures. We see him in the 20th century, but we know that he's going to live into the 21st century. And there's also Flint from one of my favorite bad Star Trek shows, uh, Requiem for Methuselah, where our heroes meet a character called Flint who was who grew up on Earth and is immortal and would therefore have lived through the founding of the Federation. And also uh, Zephyrin Cochran, the inventor of the warp drive. In Star Trek, we're told that he's, that he's connected with Alpha Centauri, but that he has a connection with Earth as well. And when I started this book, I thought, okay, I wonder which... I wonder which of those you're going to call back to. Obviously, you're going to call back to one or two of those allusions to the future in Star Trek. And <laughs> the, the Reed Stevens call back all of them. And they do it in a wonderful, wonderful way. In fact, they do a lot of callbacks that I didn't expect. A remarkably rich Star Trek novel. So I was glad to find it because the last time I got it, I got rid of it right away. Same thing with this next one. Uh, this is Edith Hamilton's The Greek Way. It is an excellent uh, primer for... Uh, the famous Greek writers. She goes through the Greek writers and some of their major concerns. It's it's a little dated and it's a little limited, uh, but it's wonderful, wonderful reading, wonderful appreciation. And I got a copy. I think I got a copy that looked exactly like this and uh, got rid of it. <laughs> Somebody said, that is exactly what I need. So I got rid of it. I sent it away. Now I have another copy. We'll see how long I keep it. And then this next one is not a duplicate. <laughs> this next one is new. And it, it, the reason I grabbed it right away is because I know the author from another book. This is uh, The New World Order by Ben Jeeps. And he did a, wrote a book called The Xenocide Mission that I really liked. It's kind of quasi-borderland YA science fiction. And I thought The Xenocide Mission was terrific. And it never occurred to me, this is weird, this is one of the weird instances, it never occurred to me that that same author would, of course, have written other books and that maybe I would like them too. <laughs> and this one seems to be completely different. It's got the photorealistic cover on the front there. I'm backlit here, so it's you're not going to be able to see it quite, quite so well. And then the photorealistic cover on the back as well with models in period armor. And some of you will recognize the period armor. This is a novel set in the reign of King Charles I. Um, this is uh, May 1645. Uh, the civil war between King Charles I and Parliament has torn England apart and is nearing its bloody conclusion. You would be excused, perhaps, for thinking that this is the introduction to a thrilling historical novel, and you'd be dead right. Yet this is not the history you know, for the world has turned on a new and deadly path, and that path is the introduction of an alien species that's involved in the, in the English Civil War. So I, it's right up my alley. I'm amazed I didn't even know this existed. So... That will be the uh, the main treat of of this little this little used book haul, this farewell to goodwill book haul. Uh, most of the others are rebuys, but the 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 New World Order I've never read, and it's by an author who has, like I've mentioned on this channel before, he has a good deal of credit in the bank with me. So um, I'll gladly read it, and maybe it'll be as good as Genocide Mission. <laughs> but that's that's it for now. Those were the books that I got on the way. I think you can count on seeing more <laughs> of me here at Little Farmhouse. So I'll. Uh, I'll wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, book two.